Okay. Okay, good evening. This is John Bennett from Miami, where this is Robotics 2, the second week of uh, Robotics Weekly. Uh, tonight, I'm, I'm, calling, I'm here in Miami, where it's, uh, there's a cold spell of 65 degrees out. I'm talking with Matt Sadef. He's a software engineer from uh, Mimic Simulation. Uh, Mimic Technology is the name of the company. Uh, he's going to talk to us tonight about about uh, robotic simulation that prepares a surgeon for the uh, how to how, how to work uh, a robotic machine to do surgery. Um, but first, uh, just a couple of remarks before uh, uh, Matt takes over. Um, this this series is designed uh, for the same reason that uh, uh, Mimic Simulation has a uh, machine. We're designed. We're, we're trying to be the interface between Internet and medicine by doing these uh, uh, Google Hangouts. And Google Hangouts is a great platform to do it. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to go over the technology behind uh, the robotics, which if you're anything like most people, I think that most people really don't understand the tech and don't understand the, the nuts and bolts of, of, a, of the uh, machine and how it works. But uh, hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll have a little understanding. So, okay, it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Dr. Bennett, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure of mine uh, to be on this platform and uh, be able to talk to um, this robotic simulation subject. Um, hello from Seattle. Um, let's see, Dr. Bennett already told about the uh, degree. Um, the temperature there, and we have a 46 uh, Fahrenheit degree here. We had a lovely day, though. It was uh, it was sunny, so uh, we're really uh, having this hunger for sunny days here. But it was great. Um, thanks a lot again, and um, I'll just basically go through um, uh, the slides that I have prepared for this, um, and let me just share my screen and start or get started with the uh, with the presentation. I just shared my screen. I'm hoping that you can see it. Okay. Yes, you can see it. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, so today uh, I'm going to talk about virtual reality-based simulation training in robot-assisted surgery. Um, let's see. And I'm just going to go go through this outline real quick to give you an idea about what exactly I'll be talking about. Um, so first, I'll be talking about the motivation behind the need of um, training in general in medicine. And then I'll be um, giving a little bit of information about min minimally invasive surgery, uh, which I uh, shorten as MIS, and also robot-assisted surgery. And then I'll talk about uh, the conventional training techniques uh, in minimally invasive surgery versus the virtual reality-based liver training techniques. Uh, then I'll be giving a short overview uh, of Mimic Technologies, our company, and the DB Trainer, our robotic surgical skills training platform. Uh, and then I'll be uh, touching the benefits uh, of VR-based simulation robot-assisted surgery training. Uh, by the way, just so you know, uh, I don't know how many people there are online right now, but I'm getting a little feedback of my own voice. So I was wondering if people on the other side could maybe just put their volume a little down. That would help, I think, with the feedback I'm getting right now. Okay, um, Mart, I, I moved my mic uh, away from the screen. I don't think it was me, but we'll see. Okay. okay. Thank you. We can try it this way. I also put my volume a little down. And uh, finally, I'll be basically talking about how we do it. After giving all this overview, uh, I like to talk about how Mimic's approach to um, virtual reality-based simulation for training in robotic surgery, meaning uh, what kind of robot-assisted um, skills we focus on, what kind of exercises and training modules we have, how do we do the actual simulation. Um, and then that is not the entire story. After that, uh, after doing the simulation, then uh, how do we evaluate the performance of the trainee to give good feedback and to make sure that there is continuous uh, performance increase? And then uh, how and why 
the different curricula is developed and how they are shared across different institutions uh, to collaborate with each other. What is the importance of independent collaboration studies and how they are uh, related and why they are necessary? And then paired dry lab uh, exercises versus virtual reality based counterparts of them and the importance of them in training. And lastly, I'm going to take this on. Uh, different training centers and training opportunities right now today that are available, along with classes for uh, acquiring robotic skills and improving them. All right, let's let's start. So, um, in terms of the motivation we have here, throughout medical history, surgical training has traditionally followed the apprenticeship model. In that, many surgeons receive their training over time in small groups of peers and superiors in the course of patient care, and they acquire their skills by observing experienced surgeons in action, and then progressively, little by little, performing additional surgical procedures under varying degrees of supervision as they advance their skills. In that, the operating room and the patient comprise the most common and most readily available and usually, unfortunately, the only setting where uh, hands-on training takes place. And the paradigm did not, the paradigm what they call the one, do one, do one, and it has been the case for open surgery, as you can see from these images. It is the case for laparoscopic surgery today, and it is still continuing to be the case for robotic surgery, as you can see. Um, however, and, and this, this apprenticeship model has been proved pretty good for the last 2,500 years. However, the experts recently have started questioning the, um, the success of this kind of training paradigm. According to a uh, recent report in 1999 uh, from Institute of Medicine uh, to Air as Human, uh, it is estimated that medical errors cost U.S. around 17 to 29 billion a year. And it is estimated that 44,000 to 98,000 Americans die every year from preventable medical errors. And uh, this is pretty bad because say that you know, if you imagine the public outrage if nearly five four seven forty seven jumbo jets crashed each week, then that would be the equivalent number uh, yearly to these numbers of people dying from preventable medical errors. And according to a um, surgeon, James Butch Russell, uh, in a study that he conducted, he determined that 82% of 150 self-proclaimed laparoscopic experts, meaning the people who call themselves experts, uh, he realized that they could not tie an intracorporeal knot in a box trainer under 10 minutes. They could not do that under 10 minutes. And he says, we found out that we are not angels of mercy, but well-paid as assassins. Um, in particular, in really invasive surgery is a revolutionary surgical technique that has been used in various procedures since the 60s. Um, in comparison to open surgery, without making large incisions, this technology involves a small video camera and a few surgical instruments, as you can see here, which are inserted into the body through small incisions. Uh, for patients, the minimum invasive surgery has many advantages uh, in comparison to open conventional surgery uh, because it, is, it means shorter hospital stay for, for patients because of uh, smaller incisions. It means quicker return to activities, less pain and scar. However, this technique poses an immediate need for improved training methods because it has its own problems. First of all, visualization of internal organs are uh, achieved with a monoscopic camera that is attached at the endoscope, and uh, the camera's field of view is pretty limited. And then um, the surgeon no longer looks at the patient, but it, he looks at the image of the camera that is reflected on the monitor in the environment, and at that point, two-dimensional, it is flat. And then hand-eye coordination is also difficult because the surgeon now must move his uh, surgical instruments. That means the manipulation is indirect. So uh, when the surgeon holds an instrument and moves his hand towards right, the instrument can be going left. Um, and that might create a big difficulty uh, for getting the skills uh, 
there in place in a short amount of time. And also the haptic feedback, the sense of touch that the surgeon is getting from the uh, organs is pretty limited because again the surgeon needs to fight with all the force interactions that comes from the pivot point, uh, which is the hole that we're entering uh, in the body through, through, the, through, the, um, through the abdominal um, area here. So, um, robot-assisted surgery is actually a type of minimally invasive surgery, uh, and I'd like to talk to you about it uh, to give give us a small introduction. About it. And um, what what the robot is, uh, or or the Da Vinci by Intuitive Surgical, as we know it right now, it is a non-autonomous minimally invasive surgical tool. Uh, it is basically a master slave system in which it is composed of a master that is called a console and a slave that is called the patient side. In this system, the surgeon sits on this console as you see here and controls a set of joystick-like controllers using his hands and controls a set of pedals using his feet. And then he puts his head on the stereoscope, which provides him with three-dimensional stereo imaging uh, from the actual patient. And on the on the patient side, uh, the robot has a total of four arms. One of which is a high-definition stereo endoscope uh, fitted with um, two cameras for left and right, and the other three can be fitted with different surgical instruments. And using the controls here at the console, the surgeon can have the controls of all these up to four number of parts at a time. And as I said, the robot is non-autonomous. So a robot, and sometimes you know, we may think, or some people may think that uh, each and every robot might be actually somewhat autonomous and might be doing some stuff uh, with their own kind of control. But here, surgeon is still. Uh, having the entire control. He is in control of everything. He is performing everything and, and, and the robot is totally behaving under the surgeon's commands. Uh, compared to laparoscopic surgery, robot assisted surgery has a lot of advantages and this is amazing technology. Uh, first and foremost, the, the, the most amazing that I find myself is uh, the articulated surgical instrument arms. Uh, the robot patient side has. If you remember on the uh, other slide that I had here, these surgical instruments are really long, slender, stick-like instruments, and they um, rotate around the pivot point, and the end of the instruments don't have any wrist. However, when you compare to the robots, uh, articulated surgical arms, you can see here that uh, it is uh, jointed such that it can correctly replicate the rotations of the human hand. And that gives a lot of additional advantage for surgeons who can replicate his, his hand movements and his hand rotations. That results in direct and intuitive movements. And when you look at here, uh, if you just take a look at the size of these instrument tips, they're really tiny actually. And what this allows is it really allows you to go in uh, a very small, tiny area or workspace, as you wish, in the abdomen or in the um, target of operation. And then in that area, you can do really delicate movements to work on delicate tissue uh, without resulting in um, large uh, deformations of the tissue or uh, resulting into uh, damage on the tissue. And as I said before, the movements are direct and intuitive. That means, in comparison to laparoscopic surgery and robot-assisted surgery, uh, the, the movements are, the directions are one-to-one. -one. When you move your hand to right, the instrument goes to right. You can also scale your motion so that uh, if you're working on really delicate tissue, you can do different motion scalings, like five-to-one or two-to-one, which means if you're moving your hand five times, then the instrument is actually only going like one time or two times. That gives you also a lot of comfort in your own workspace while you're working with the but on the patient side that results into very tiny moments. The other great aspect of uh, the Da Vinci, the robot assisted surgery here, is the use of the stereo endoscope. As you can see, the endoscope that is usually used has two cameras. These are two high definition cameras and this is kind of like the vision that the surgeon has on the console. And if you go down here, 
this would be an example actual robotic surgery image that is coming from the endoscope for the left eye and the right eye. And uh, if you just pay attention here, you will see that the left and right eye here are, are slightly different images. They are slightly shifted on the horizontal, which is basically the ocular disparity. This image in combination at the stereoscope gives the surgeon the depth, gives the surgeon the three-dimensional uh, view. And really what robotic surgery then allows is it's really as if you're opening all this tissue up, as if you're really inserting your head right there, right in front of the tissue that you're going to work on, and as if you have the entire freedom of your wrists to work on that tissue. Let's move on. Uh, however, just like any other surgery, robotic surgery comes with its own advantages and disadvantages. For the visualization and indirect manipulation, disadvantages of laparoscopic surgery, robot assisted surgery already solves them in a great way. Um, the hand eye coordination is much easier compared to laparoscopic surgery. However, the system still some getting used, just like any other system. Uh, when it comes to disadvantages, maybe, uh, you can say that there is no haptic feedback of the tissues that you are operating on. Well, the, the current design uh, does not let the user um, feel when they are manipulating the tissue, meaning when they are retracting the tissue, when you're, they're grasping it and they're cutting it, they don't feel the interaction forces coming from the tissue. And that might or might not be a disadvantage for, for some users. Um, more about the training part, uh, the, uh, some hospitals, according to our experience, might find it expensive to train on the robot, uh, unless a hospital usually um, buys another training robot, another robot, and just reserves that robot for training at all times. Usually, the hospitals, uh, f according to our experience, find it difficult to make the robot available for training. Uh, usually, um, the robot is busy in the operating room, um, most doing operations, and then that might make it a little difficult for people to get on the actual robot to train themselves. Um, which also talks about a little bit the accessibility uh, of the robot for training. Let's see. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little about the conventional training techniques that has been used, especially in minimally invasive surgery. So, although the input from minimally invasive surgery can be quite an acknowledged, there is no consensus of the most effective training method, and there have been a number of methods that have been used. One of them is box trainers. For mostly laparoscopic surgical training setting, uh, what a box trainer is, is really it's a box where you insert the uh, laparoscopic instruments in and where you insert the camera, which is kind of mimicking the environment in a, in a surgery. And in that box, uh, the task would be working on some um, some actual physical objects uh, with some tests. For example, in this case, it would be like picking up some certain objects in certain colors, and then maybe transferring them in between different, different tools, and then maybe placing them in different tags. These kind of exercises usually works on hand-eye coordination. And there might be other exercises that are like um, there might be a sponge where you might practice suturing using yeah, using levers. Uh, this has the immediate advantages of like being cheap and being pretty accessible, and you can even replicate this you know, with a cardboard box if you want to, if you have the surgical instruments with you. However, it comes with its own disadvantages. So it is usually poor imitation uh, procedures. You cannot really just put an actual procedure there to, uh, to work on. It is not easily customizable. Uh, you know, once you build or once you have a set of objects, it is not very easy to just customize them into the way that you want to train with them. And it's also, one of the most important is not easy to measure the performance. You really need to have a proctor standing by you to just watch what you did. And then that proctor will do the evaluation for you. However, also, that evaluation will be pretty subjective. It won't be standard. It will depend on who it is, uh, who is doing that, um, that evaluation. Another widely used training technique that has been used uh, in MIS is animal or cadaver training. And in that case, we are much closer to the actual 
to the human tissue setting. Uh, the animal tissues are similar to human tissues, not exactly the same, but they're similar. And when you operate on them, when you manipulate them, they react similarly to what a human tissue would react. Or in the case of cadaver training, then you have the actual anatomical structures in front of you. Although it is dead, it is still the same structure. Um, so in that, so for most reasons, animal and cattle training might be quite beautiful. However, they also come with their own disadvantages. One of them is being expensive. Another one is being for the case of animal training. Uh, some people find it controversial and non-ethical. Uh, again, for animals, the tissues that you're working on, although they are similar, they are still different anatomical structures compared to humans. And for, for the case of cadavers, the tissue properties have already changed because the tissues are no longer life. Um, and then, again, when it comes to quanti quantitative analysis of the performance, it is difficult to do that. And if it's, again, difficult to do it objectively. So to summar summarize uh, the combination of MIS training, uh, we'll see that there is the immediate need for an instructor or supervisor. There has to be someone who is watching over you for giving you feedback. And the feedback methods that they use or they can come up with will be pretty non-standard non -standard because it will be subjective uh, to that person. How about then realistic virtual reality based surgical simulators? And here I'm going to go over what realistic virtual reality based surgical simulators are capable of when it comes to training. So they can reduce risks and constraints of surgical procedures. You don't have to get your very first operation on an actual human to start training your skills. Uh, you can do all your training on virtual versions of the patients in a surgical simulator. Uh, and then you can quantify your performance and progress there in an objective environment. The surgical simulators nowadays can easily be coupled with um, some kind of standard performance methods, methods and um, during the exercise, the simulator can record what you have done, and, and according to that, it can create a standardized output for your performance, which will be the same for animals. And then you can, for example, use a simulator for unusual case training, meaning you can create disaster situations, like you can create a scenario where an aorta or like a, a, a major vein is just ruptured and the blood is flowing all over the place and your task is, um, is repairing that structure as soon as possible with the least amount of blood, for example. In such a case, you can uh, test the people's skills in stressful situations, for example, and you can do the training in such a way that such that the uh, the outcome, even if you you know result in the patient dying, it's a virtual patient, no harm done. You are allowed to move. That is the best thing about it. Uh, and then, as I said, with a standardized training regimen, you can make people go through the exact same exercises in the exact same order, so that um, they would, would be all getting a similar, if not the same, uh, exact training. With a sim surgical simulator, since it's, it's going to be available 24-7, you can train people, credential them, meaning that you can use the same environment to test them, and then you can retrain them uh, for the cases when um, you would like to do skill retention. For many surgeons, according to our experience, they are in need of like um, continuing to practice on a regular basis their, uh, their own skills because there might be cases where uh, for a surgeon he might not have a chance to um, go ahead and operate on a robot uh, for a month or for two months. And if that happens over that time, we think that it would be quite useful for per people to have other training methodologies available to keep practicing on those and to keep their skills sharp. So in general then, overall, what we believe is better trained positions will lead to less errors, which will lead to improved patient care. And that is the holy grail. So we think that this would revolutionize the medical education. And then the training paradigm of C1, do one, teach one might actually turn into see many, do many, and maybe teach none. Uh, if you have of 
realistic virtual reality that could make you uh, at your, uh, your pleasure to, to work with. All right, um, so after giving all that overview, now I would like to talk a little bit about the, the company that I'm working at. Um, and just a little overview. So Mimic Technologies is a pioneer and leader in robotic surgery simulation. Uh, we are a group of people who are passionate about fusing virtual reality and surgical robotics to create revolutionary products and unique services that will profoundly impact people's lives. Uh, so about the company, again, we are founded in 2001 as a spun-off from University of Washington's um, um, University of Washington, and the, I, I'd like to uh, the name of the lab. Uh, I think it was a Human Interaction Technology Lab, HIT Lab, uh, if I'm not wrong. And it was founded by Dr. Jeff Berkeley, uh, who has a PhD from computer science uh, from there. Uh, we are headquartered in Seattle, Washington. Our business and research focus are robotic surgery simulation, force feedback device technology, and simulation training in general. Uh, during our initial years, we were funded with uh, grants from the Department of Defense for a lot of Army and medical related projects. And then later on, uh, we still continue uh, getting funded from there, but also uh, we also have been self funded uh, from our own product and service revenues. And in terms of relationships, we have been collaborating with Intuitive Surgical since 2003. Uh, for the actual development of our own surgical simulator. We have more than 80 different medical institutions and research partners we collaborate with. Uh, with our own standard simulator and creative surgical uh, SI skill simulator, which uh, uses a similar software that we, um, that we license to them. Combined, we have more than a thousand uh, places as our install base. And we have a lot of associations in terms of robotic surgery that we work closely with, like Mira, SRS, CRSA, Surges, and ERUS. And also AUA, AIGL, ACS, and SLS conferences. One, one small thing about our customers and research partners, we have a lot of customers in the US, in Canada, Japan, Europe, Middle East, Brazil, China, and Korea. Uh, and a lot of these places are research universities, research hospitals, um, some community hospitals, and uh, a few training centers, if you will, um, who would like to form uh, their own centers for teaching uh, or skills training uh, in their own. All right, um, now that I gave you that overview about the company, I would like to talk about. Um, the simulator that we create for robot assisted surgical skills training. Uh, the, the name of our simulator is DV Trainer, and DV stands for Da Vinci Trainer. And it is the first simulator to create the look and feel of the So now that I start working on this, I'm more and more kind of like talking about how we do our simulation, what is our approach, and what we think the simulation should be in general for a good robot assisted surgical skills training. And in this case, you know, we are doing simulation in that animation, and that means trying to recreate the actual feel of the thing. In these images, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can see here, uh, there is a person that is sitting on our uh, trainer surgical simulators console, and there is the surgeon here who is standing on the actual, sorry, who is sitting on the actual console. And the way that they look is similar. They they use similar controls. They use the exact same paddles. Uh, uh, so um, this is creating a very good look and feel. Very similar look and feel. Um, we, we call this as a cost-effective standalone alternative to learning directly on the robot. Um, usually, medical devices tend to be um, pretty um, expensive, maybe. And, and our experience tells us for the other um, areas of simulation, we have always seen that simulators tend to be cheaper. In our case, it's the same. It is uh, it's cheaper than buying a robot for actually training. Our target users would be like surgeons, actually no surgeons who might have less than or around 10 robotic cases, and usually residents and fellows. And our target applications are immediate robotic skills training for novice surgeons, would be skill retention and rehearsal for 
experience surgeons for them to keep um, keep practicing their skills. It might be used for credentialing and privilege in academic research. All these blueprints are, are the actual uses that have been uh, in effect by you know, uh, people who bought either a DV training or who bought into the surgical skills training. So this is what we're experiencing that they those people are doing their simulation. Let's talk about the benefits in general of virtual reality based simulation in, in robotic training. Uh, so so uh, I already mentioned reduced costs uh, for training. Uh, it is not only really the cost of the robot, but um, mostly most hospitals uh, keep their robot pretty busy with the operation uh, at all times. And then um, you know, taking the robot from the operating room for people to train on would be kind of costly for them in terms of operating operating room time and cost. Uh, and a simulator is not is not a medical device. Therefore, the simulator does not need any training instruments, or it doesn't need a robot to be on if it's a standalone one. And uh, with, with, with that in mind, again, I will have a reduced training cost compared to training exactly on the on the robot. And then the access is because if, if you have a simulator, then that simulator might be made available 24 7 for anyone to go and train themselves by themselves instead of just having to go to the operating room to the robot. Um, and the might actually help uh, the hospitals because then it frees up clinical robot time. And uh, the robot might fully be used just for the operating uh, room, and the simulator can be used for uh, more for skills training. And uh, it helps speeding up the learning curve for people uh, when it comes to uh, training their skills. Um, and then eventually, overall, a virtual reality simulator would result in improved patient safety because it is going to be uh, hopefully helpful for surgeons to get their skills pretty sharp. Um, the way that we develop our surgical simulator is uh, like the following. So we have different training modules and those different training modules are composed of exercises that are aimed at um, training for particular specific robot assisted surgery fields. Those skills, I will give more information in more detail later, but if you take a look at here, for example, this from the simulator, and you can see in this module, in these buttons, that the actual modules like overview of the surgeon's console, like manipulation of the wristed and wrist arms, the Control for camera and control of, of clutching, and then um, energy application. The robot is able to apply um, monocoic energy, monocot energy, bipolar energy. So in such a module, you can practice those. You can you can um, train for dissection skills. Uh, there are modules for needle control, needle driving, and even troubleshooting, uh, just like the example I gave you before, of, like giving unusual circumstances. Or maybe the robot just throwing a bug or throwing an error all of a sudden in the middle of the surgery. And then these kind of exercises teach you how to handle those errors that the robot might just throw at the time. And of course, uh, we like games and we think that games are part of uh, motivation for people and we also placed a number of games there that they can play using their actual robotic uh, virtual instruments. So these images kind of like summarize it. For example, this image here is called pick and place and this focuses on uh, training the hand-eye coordination of the surgeon. Uh, it just involves picking up objects and placing them in their pockets. It's pretty simple, but it's a ground, pretty important infrastructural skill uh, for a person's hand-eye coordination to be good enough to, to do good robotic surgery. And then this uh, image on the left is from a knot tying exercise, for example, and we have different exercises for um, training different knot tying skills, like overhand knot, like surgeon's knot, like um, gravy knot. And you can program the surgical simulator such that it can give you feedback. In our case, it gives you a feedback to let you know how much further you need to tighten 
the, the suture after you make the knot to make that knot a an, a um, uh, make that knot a um, permanent knot. And then this exercise on upright uh, is making user train for their fourth arm use skills, or some people call it the third arm, um, which can be used such that surgeons one hand um, can exchange control in between two of these instruments and then um, surgeon can focus on using only two while the other instrument can be just frozen in place to retract something or to just find a way out or just open the way out. There are other exercises or other training modules if you wish which can be used for training energy. For example in this exercise here um, different Education skills are um, from these artificially formed um, vessel-like structures. And this one on the right um, is kind of like a procedure step exercise in which you do suturing uh, in between two tubes which are like really bladders and it's as if you're anastomosizing these two bladders to each other by um, suturing those two bladders to each other using your instruments and using a suture thread that has uh, two curved needles at each end. So now I, I'd like to talk a little bit further about the details of how we do the simulation. For us, uh, the simulation is really composed of the knowledge and experience in state-of-the-art computer science. So uh, we use computer graphics, we use virtual reality, we use physically based simulation and game development techniques in our own simulation. And we believe that the simulation should be needs driven, not technology driven. That means continuous communication with medical professionals for exercise to find validation and continuous feedback. We love talking to uh, medical doctors, we love talking to surgeons, we learn so much from them and really we believe that the key is identifying the areas that they think there is a need for training and then focusing on those areas and creating customized exercises, customized uh, curriculum for those people to meet their training needs using the exercises in virtual reality simulation. We believe that to be able to successfully simulate, uh, realism and accuracy are pretty important. And there comes uh, the collaboration with Intuitive Surgical. We think that it's key and it's really important uh, because uh, we would like to simulate an accurate hardware with correct touch and feel. As you can see in these two images, the real and simulated uh, uh, situations are pretty similar to each other for the hardware here the surgeon sits on the console of the actual robot and here the trainee sits on the console of the simulator and they have similar if not the same controllers uh, like pedals here or like these uh, masters uh, that are used by the hands or like the stereoscope here uh, and those controls are all need to be pretty similar to actually to simulate it correctly. Also there should be accurate robot kinematics and modeling uh, meaning, uh, in a correct simulation environment, the um, the knowledge of how the patient's side arms are going to move under certain different types of input from the console is pretty important to know, and it is key to have it done correctly in the simulator. Therefore, the user who sits on the simulator or who sits on the real thing would not really see the difference between how those uh, instruments would behave. They should really feel like they are actually operating or using an actual console instead of a simulator. And the same is true for realistic instruments and icon, mo icon, icon modeling. Uh, as you can see in these two images, the one on the left is the real image from an actual session from the endoscope of a robot and the one on the right is a simulated session. And you can see that the instrument models are the same. They are developed based on, in simulation, they are developed based on CAD models uh, that comes out of our uh, fruitful collaboration with Intuitive. And also, in terms of, again, realism and accuracy, uh, we believe that physics-based simulation is key for tool-object interactions. Uh, 
to be able to make the user really feel like he is interacting with objects in, in real life. So all those calculations and simulation we think should be physically based. For that, for example, in our own case, we have a proprietary simulation platform that we have developed, which features realistic physics-based simulation. Um, it features realistic graphical rendering, uh, like realistic looking at physical objects, realistic looking abdominal walls, as you can see here, uh, accurate texture mapping for the structures to look as um, as close to real as possible, and the actual visual effects that come from the robot, for example, shadows, uh, like this image on the left is an actual image that comes from a robot, and if you appreciate it, uh, there is uh, hints of soft shadow on the, at the abdominal wall behind the uh, instrument here, and that comes because of the fact that the endoscope uh, is fitted with a pretty strong uh, LED light as well, and that light and the camera are at the same location, so very Wherever you're looking, you're always highlighting and you're always lighting that area. Also, same is true for balloon, for example. If you see the real image here, the, the metallic instrument has quite a bit of reflection from the actual light. And on the case of simulation, it is important to be able to simulate those kind of effects so that people will think that when they're using the robot, the instruments are real looking and um, behaving uh, close to real. And then real-time simulation performance is important. What is real-time simulation performance? It means when you're simulating something, when you are dealing with those virtual objects, um, those virtual objects should respond pretty quickly, just as if you're handling an object, like you're picking up your cup of coffee and then just placing it somewhere, like you're touching it. As soon as you touch it, you feel. As soon as you move it, it moves. Uh, that is pretty important. And in our case, we also have rapid content generation availability where uh, we can, in a fast manner, create different exercises according to different uh, defined and required robotics. And what are our exercises like? Or in general, what kind of exercises would be in a virtual reality simulator? Uh, there will be a bunch, and I think it is important then to develop those exercises towards training different basic and advanced robotic assistive services. So there will be dry lab simulators, which is like this case where you handle a bunch of physical objects and you manipulate them, and the task will be just picking them up and placing them in their matching locations. Um, which helps for hand eye coordination and object manipulation and endorsement. There might be simple exercises in anatomy, like this case here, where you um, train your energy application skills. There might be procedure step like exercises, where, in, like, like in this case, you are anastomosizing, for example, you're suturing together uh, two tube like or bladder like structures, and in this case, you're doing kind of like a step of many of the surgeries in which, I mean, in, in a lot of the surgeries, you will have to. Um, you will have to start suturing different structures that you cut out. And in this case, you are practicing suturing, for example. Uh, there might be procedure-specific exercises in, in, in case of, for example, this example, where um, we are playing back previously recorded um, sessions from a robotic suit, and then we are augmenting our own virtual instruments on top of that um, to just, for example, identify anatomy in this case. And this particular image is from a proof of concept of this augmented reality technology that we have started using in a proof of concept. What others? So we believe that, we think that there will be in the future patient-specific exercises. Like, think about the case where you have a patient and the patient has uh, his CT scan images, and in a day or two you um, operate on that patient. Uh, what if you had a simulation environment where you can load those CT scan images so that the simulator can create that patient's uh, organ models uh, quickly? And then those organ models would directly 
refer to that exact patient, and then you'll have a chance maybe to rehearse different ideas that you have, uh, different different surgical ideas, different operation ideas that you have in different sessions of, of the exercise, which is using the actual surgeon, uh, sorry, the actual patient's organ models. How about like full procedure simulation, where uh, which, which would be like a combination of uh, starting from a simple exercise or maybe a procedure step to a procedure specific and maybe patient specific. In a full procedure simulation case, it might be composed of uh, uh, like the, um, all, all, it might it might be composed of like preparing the patient. It might be composed of creating the. Uh, the holes, the pores of, of the patient to insert and uh, get the robotic arms ready for the surgeon. It might be composed of, after the surgeon is done, it might be composed of for all the other operating room um, personnel to start closing the patient up, for example. And again, maybe one last holy grail of the simulation would be like operating room choreography simulation or team training. Uh, we believe, we believe that it is just not enough to only train the surgeon. We think that surgery in general is a teamwork, and we, we find it pretty important for every single person in that operating room to exactly know and have their skills to the level such that they will know when to do, what to do. And how about just trying to come up with a simulator to train all that operating room stuff? Uh, so that everybody uh, gets all their skills to the level that they will be ready for an actual surgery. So I had talked about like different robotic skills before, and this slide kind of shows you uh, what kind of robotic skills that we are trying to um, train people on. Uh, those can be classified like system settings and controls, meaning like all the controls available on the robot. That might be like endorse manipulation, Control of the camera, correction, dissection, energy control, uh, the fork arm control, needle control, needle driving, uh, and additionally switching and not tying skills. Um, so these are currently the um, robot assisted surgery skills that the exercises that Mimic has in its surgical simulator that just tries to train people for. And we believe that just doing the simulation is, is not enough. At the end of the simulation, the trainee should be should, should be showed a standardized and objective performance evaluation for him to learn from his mistakes and for him to keep track of his own personal um, progress of his skills. So for that, we have worked uh, and collaborated with uh, many uh, surgeons all over the world to come up with uh, validated, uh, pretty strong metrics. Uh, we believe uh, are uh, good enough uh, for for good training and for good performance evaluation. Those metrics that we came up with would be like time to complete an exercise, like economy of motion, uh, meaning how much uh, you move your instruments in general, like instrument collisions, if you have collided an instrument or not, like misapplied energy, if you have applied energy incorrectly. It might be like the lot loss volume if you're working on any structure, if you're losing uh, more than a, a good amount of blood, or like broken vessels, if you have broken any vessels or not. So for this performance evaluation, uh, we worked with around 100 expert robotic surgeons with more than 75 cases all over the world. We went ahead and let those uh, expert surgeons perform our exercises and collect their data in terms of these metrics. And then we did statistical analysis on these metrics and then came up with the proficiency values and passing values for all these metrics. So one can use that statistical analysis data and place that into their simulator such that um, the simulator can train a completely novice level uh, of, of the skills of actual experts. Um, and this this model here we call is proficiency based scoring, and this is modeled after fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery's uh, metric evaluation system. Another uh, point that I would like to make is uh, curriculum development and the rules of it. Uh, currently, in, in our own case, in our own uh, surgical simulator, we have more than 50 exercises. So sometimes it might not be 
the best way to expose a complex nervous person immediately to all those different 50 plus exercises because all those exercises come in different modules and they have different activity levels. One can create different curriculum for different needs. You might have a curriculum which is composed of exercises that are totally geared towards uh, complete nervous people. You can have a different curriculum which has slightly more advanced or more advanced exercises in them that might be geared towards skill retention, that might be geared towards expert people to just keep practicing and keep their skills um, skills sharp. Um, so um, what we have done in our simulator is that uh, the simulator itself uh, can um, a person, an administrator, select a simulator and create a curriculum of his own choice, in which he can form that curriculum and exercises of his own choice. And then he can uh, save that curriculum, he can export that curriculum, and then he can upload it to a, sh a um, common sharing portal, in which, for example, if you are a very good experienced surgeon and if you're using a particular curriculum, then you can make it available for other people to download it on this sharing platform, and then those people People can apply the exact same curriculum in their own own DV trainer uh, to train their own people according to that st standardized uh, training regimen. And here in this exercise or in this image, you can see there are different curriculum for latency training, meaning um, you know robotic surgery in general is really tele robotics. That means there is just a connection between master and slave, so uh, that kind of frees you up and that just um, might make it available for the counselor to be not in the operating room, in the same operating room in the, uh, in the patient side. You might be doing telesurgery from a different state, from a different state, from overseas. And in that case, according to the speed of your communication, latency can become an issue. How about like in 10 years or 20 years from now, if telesurgery becomes more and more available, then those latency levels might change depending on the location. And for that, people now, the researchers now, think that they should go through different latency levels and they should train for that. For example, there's a curriculum for that. There is the curriculum of, for example, main medical center here. There's a curriculum for surgical warm up. Warm -up. That means like just before you start doing your surgery, just like just like an athlete who just starts warming up before doing the actual competition. As a surgeon, you can't start warming up your skills just before the surgery. And then that just um, brings up your skills, that just uh, you know, reminds you what you need to do, and then immediately after that, you can immediately go, go to the operating room with, with pretty, pretty good warm up. And then uh, you might have advanced training exercises, or again, different institutions can have their own training. They can all share this. And this really um, promotes collaboration and interaction between different institutions and individuals. And uh, if you can, if, if you go to Mimic's website, there is already a bunch uh, available of these different curriculum that have been generated and developed by different institutions. Okay, excuse me. Um, yeah. we, I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you very much. I have a much better idea of what's going on, but we have a few questions here. I'd like to see if you could, could just address them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. We haven't had the, this many questions ever before, so you obviously struck a, a chord of, of ignorance for me anyways. Okay, the first question is, has Google Glass ever been used in robotic surgery? I guess that's not really a simulation question, but... Do you know, has Google Glass ever been used so that it can, actually it would probably be a pretty educational thing, uh, just as as uh, simulation is, but do you know of any cases that's been used? Or? To my knowledge, I don't. It might have been used, but I can easily see how it can be used. I can easily just uh, relate that to augmented reality. So. Um, I'm, I'm not sure in the case of robotic surgery, but in general, say that you're doing open surgery or say that you're doing laparoscopic surgery and you're looking at the patient's abdomen. Then if you have a glass, Google Glass-like structure, you might, you know, the technology might be such that you might have uh, pre-made CT scan images or pre-made, for example, um, uh, ultrasound images of, of the organs of the, of the patient that you're working on. And then if you have the glass, if it registers good enough, then wherever you're looking, it can augment those virtual images, for example, on the body of the patient, so that you can have a better idea and immediate access to all those pre-surgical material that you would want to have handy in your environment. 
Um, so yeah, from that it. respect, it might be pretty useful. Yeah, that might be a good uh, thing to put into the training uh, also. Um, and the next question is, is DaVinci the only, uh, is your simulator just for DaVinci machines or for any any uh, robotic machines? Because I understand there's more than one company, correct? I, I couldn't get your final question. Can you repeat the final question? The final sentence? Yeah, uh, is, is DaVinci, is, is this simulator just made for DaVinci robotic machines or for all robotic machines? Cur currently, DV Trainer is geared towards and made for DaVinci. It is simulating the actual DaVinci robotic machine. Okay, okay. Okay, um, another question that must have been read by a urologist. Mm -hmm. or, or not a urologist, but someone that's outside of urology. Has laparoscopic uh, procedures in urology disappeared now that the robotic uh, surgeon is on the scene? Uh, I don't think they have disappeared, and I, I personally don't think that they will uh, disappear soon, but eventually they might. So right now, robotic uh, and laparoscopic uh, techniques are going hand in hand and in fact there are still a big number of uh, surgeons who you know are very good laparoscopic surgeons and um, some of them just you know don't like maybe another technique uh, and there are some others who just like another technique so there are these different kinds of people and as long as uh, that that keeps happening then I think people will probably stick to the technique that they know the best and that they like or prefer the best. Okay, one, one question that, that I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Did uh, the development of your software, uh, did, did 2D go to 3D once you really developed the software well? Was that what made it go from 3D to 3D? Was it so simply a software development? Dr. Bennett, you're getting caught. I couldn't like get half of the entire sentence. That's all right. Okay, did the technology go from 2D to 3D with with software development? Is that what happened? Is that why it went to 3D? Um, I don't exactly know for robotic surgery why it went to uh, Let's see, if, if it went from 2D to 3D, what I know is for laparoscopy, it has been 2D imaging. And I think one thing that they wanted to improve on with robotic surgical uh, systems addition uh, uh, to, to, the, to the science is that they wanted to have stereo imaging and they wanted to like give the user a better idea and further depth by making it 3D, making it stereo. So I don't know if actually, you know, one of the first examples of robotic surgical systems uh, came out in, in 2D imaging. I don't think so. I think they probably have always been 3D, uh, commercially available, but uh, don't quote me on that. I, I, I cannot really say for sure. Okay. Um. Very good. I'm going to try to share the screen here for a second. So could you give me this? You're off screen sharing, correct? Uh, are you going to share something right now? Yeah, I'm going to try to share some links that have to do with simulation, actually, in okay. another part of medicine. Okay. Uh, because as you know, that's, that's a te teaching technology that you guys uh, are using, but it's also currently being used in other arenas, and I, I just want to try to get uh, the screen here. Um, as usual, Mr. Google is going slow when you share the screen, <laughs> so I'll do my best here. Hang on, folks. But while we're waiting, uh, I understand you, you're a Turkish folk song, song singer. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, you, uh, you, can, you can sing songs while we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> uh, Yes, yeah, singing, okay. is, singing is a hobby of mine. Uh, I like singing a lot. Well, I, I guess we consider this a ter commercial break. Um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, I'm having a hard time getting this love because, there, you know, I'm going to tell us all the folks there are some bugs in this program. It's not perfect, but mm -hmm. I, I think Google's committed uh, to improving it. Um, so I won't be able to show you those links. However, the links are on the bottom of the robotics-weekly page. Uh, you can go through them, but let, let me essentially outline what they say. Um, that, that simulation is not only being used by uh, mimic technologies, it's also used in other areas of medicine. 
uh, university in up in Maine in Portland, mm -hmm. they established establish a five million dollar simulation center for the medical students to examine patients. Uh, wow. And the actual robots, uh, Mert, they would they would make them so that uh, an outside person behind a glass could alter the blood pressure, could alter the pulse, wow. uh, to wow. help train the students in much the same way that you guys train uh, surgeons. Uh, it puts them through simulated uh, clinical scenarios to see how they react. And an another link uh, that I put down at the bottom of that page was about uh, there's, a, there's, there's a strange marriage of an art school in Glasgow, Scotland with uh, web developers over there. They're developing um, uh, an application with a, that goes with a computer and has a peripheral that you can manipulate with the hand and then you can actually simulate doing uh, dental injections uh, and it actually feels like you're going into the skin. That's uh, awesome. It's kind of hard to explain. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I wish I could show you that link. Um, it, it really is uh, a, tr a tremendous thing. You, you'll be able to do procedures from your computer. Uh, with that peripheral, it's like a, a manual type of joystick that uh, mm -hmm. that you manipulate and that you that you uh, here maybe I can get it here. Hopefully I'll get it uh, that you can manipulate and it does simulate the actual clinical condition. And I that's another question. Uh, 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 there was an article today about how robotics are developing. I guess sensory is, is called haptic, correct? Is that, is that, am I not correctly? Uh, sense of touch and computer generated uh, forces are usually called, yeah, computer haptics. Oh, okay. Well, um, apparently with this software they're developing in Scotland, you get the feel of the needle piercing the skin. Yeah, uh, that's do, it. Do you have that with, do you have that with robotic, uh, your, your uh, simulator? Do you get the feel? You, you get a haptic type of uh, sensory feeling? Our device is a perfectly capable haptic device that is actually capable of displaying forces. However, in the case of um, Da Vinci simulation, we do not enable uh, those haptic feedback features uh, for you to feel anything because in the actual robot, there is no haptic feedback. Uh, as far as okay. when it comes to touching tissues or touching organs or manipulating objects. The, the actual robot console only gives you haptic feedback when you run into the uh, joint limits of the patient arms. But other than that, you actually don't feel what you're touching. And uh, because we're simulating the actual thing, and because we don't want to negative train anybody, uh, we are disabling those, those features and we are trying to simulate exactly how it happens in the robot. But if it, if, it, if it's necessary, for example, to simulate a different robot which has uh, haptic sensation and which lets user to, you know, sense things, then uh, in theory our hardware would be uh, capable enough to uh, simulate that with haptic uh, forces as well. Do you, do you see that in the future for a simulator? Um, I think we, we believe that Intersurgical has been doing an awesome job in, in, this, in this industry, creating Da Vinci. It's, it's a great machine, but uh, it is such an exciting and motivational area. We think that there will be probably other companies that will try uh, and create their own take uh, for, for robotic surgery in general. So uh, we, we think that it's perfectly possible uh, in, in the coming future that there might be other companies who would like to uh, create their own robotic systems for robotic surgery or including intuitive surgical maybe there might be companies who might continue to improve their systems and uh, provide additional technologies on their uh, on their system base. Now you, you have some type of program that once you go to the school in Florida that you can, I, I think it's called M-Share where you can actually trade uh, cases with other surgeons in other parts of the world. You can kind of like network with other surgeons in other parts of the world. Um, let's see. Uh, is that called M-Share? You have some type of program with the, 
Yes, the, uh, it, it is called M-Share, but it is really a, a sharing platform for the curriculum that you develop on the on the simulator. Uh, so it's not oh, okay. really sharing other cases, but if, if you create a curriculum okay. in, in your own simulator, then you can export it and you can share it with other people so that other people can follow the exact same order or same metrics or they, they can do the same exercises, perform the same exercises as they other as others did. And I, I have, I think, one slide that I uh, you might find it useful that I can talk about, about actually sure. training, training sure. courses. Sure. And for that, uh, now I can reference to, to Florida, your, your previous reference. So what we have in Florida is we have this company called MimicMat, which is a sibling company of, of uh, Mimic Technologies. And MimicMat focuses on um, simulation-based training in general. Um, so what we have there is we uh, collaborate with Florida Hospital at Celebration. Uh, we, we have an office there at Nicholson Center. And uh, we also collaborate with Dr. V. Patel uh, from Florida Hospital at Celebration. Uh, Dr. V. Patel particularly uh, is a very well-known uh, robotic uh, surgeon uh, who has performed, I think I can safely say, more than 5,000 uh, cases just uh, prostatectomy uh, robotically. And we know that he also performs radical nephrectomies and partial nephrectomies as well. But it is uh, our great uh, honor to be able to work with him there. And we, we hold simulation-based training classes there. And in that, uh, people can come there, go there, and they, ha they can have full-day classes, half-day classes. They can have individual uh, personalized training. Um, and what we have there is we have, I think, uh, more than 10 or maybe I can say at least 12 simulators all available at once. And people can basically bring their group of novice surgeons there for them to train all at once. And these classes can be integrated with other advanced intuitive surgical classes as well. Uh, or it can be customized and partnered with, with other institutions. And this is one example. And there's another uh, you know, simulation training, uh, like robotic skills training example, from Nancy University Hospital uh, from France. Uh, this is Dr. Huber, uh, who is another uh, collaborator of us, and we're uh, really lucky and glad that we are collaborating with them as well. So what they have is they have their own individual hospitals training center, and simulation training is a big part of their training center. What they do there is they hold um, uh, courses that last for a few days, I think, maybe up to a week or more, and in those courses, uh, they let people uh, do skills training on the uh, DV trainers uh, for a while, uh, and then uh, they do dry labs with the actual robot, and they do animal training as well. Um, so uh, there, it's it's really exciting to see you know individual training centers uh, that are being formed in different parts of the world uh, for this purpose because uh, you know training really has uh, has let's see we we really think that there should be enough training opportunities for people and if it's not possible in the hospital who owns the Da Vinci then I think or we think it should be uh, made available in these uh, training training centers and it's a great opportunity for people to go there and take individual courses there. That's great. Now, now the, these courses are they pre at uh, uh, certain times of the year or can you kind of go when you want to or uh, once a month? How, how often do they, the, they, they go? I think at Nicholson Center in Florida, uh, they are uh, just available all the time during the year. All you need to do is just really contact the company and uh, contact our training coordinator or uh, executive director of MimicMed, uh, who is in charge of uh, preparing these classes and holding these classes and courses. Um, they're, they're available year round. And for Nancy, I'm not sure. I cannot really talk to that correctly, probably, but. Uh, I can provide the information for that, and people can actually uh, contact uh, the Department of Urology at uh, Nancy Hospital if they're in Europe, for example. They can get their training from there. Okay. Well, very good. I think you covered a lot of ground tonight, and uh, I really appreciate uh, for you and your company to come on and, and to help us uh, understand what is robotic surgery. It's a mystery, but it's less of a mystery now. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to come back and uh, with the other surgeons on the on the panel, 
and I apologize for any technical difficulties. We're learning this technology, but I think uh, I think it's a great step in medical education because uh, you get, you know you get to hear about. Uh, I'm sure people have seen this machine in the operating room. We don't know how it works. How do these surgeons learn what they're doing? Uh, I think it's a it's a big advance uh, and ad advances in simulation, which is occurring in other parts of medicine as well. So I thank you very much and. Uh, Good night in Seattle. Stay on. I'm just going to go off broadcast. I'll talk to you after the broadcast. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Dr. Bennett. It was my pleasure uh, uh, being being with you today and giving the talk. And um, hoping to and looking forward to more and further collaboration. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot.